Good afternoon, I am Mark Gallagher. I am a member of the Education 1107 class at Florida Southern College. My micro teaching topic is social learning theory uh, developed by Al Bandura. And to get things started, I wanted to uh, display a rather well known example of social learning, uh, especially well known for people between about the age of 35 and 55 uh, because of its uh, popularity in culture uh, during you know about past 15 years. So we'll get started with that first. I'll say that she's much. Students um, were 
asked in a lot of ways to take ownership of their learning. And this, this, this phenomenon, this process, had a very specific effect on young Mr. Bandura, who realized early on that you know, the context or the, the contents of a book uh, could change or become meaningless very quickly as new ideas and new theories were proposed. But what was important was the ability to manage learning and to continue the, the techniques, the steps, the processes necessary uh, to do that learning. And so from an early age, he had uh, an appreciation for the value of learning in the human experience. And this propelled him forward. Um, he went to the University of British Columbia, got his bachelor's degree, earned his PhD uh, from the University of Iowa, and then shortly thereafter began teaching uh, in Palo Alto, California at Stanford University, um, where he began some experiments uh, and did a lot of research all around this idea of social cognitive theory. He was the president of the APA for a while, the American Psychological Association, and despite uh, being more than 90 years of age now, still teaches at Stanford University, is one of a pair of farmers who still grows vegetables out their window uh, at the farm, which is a nickname given to Stanford University. So a very full life uh, studying and serving our understanding of our own learning. Here's that uh, idea I previously mentioned about Bandura's thought about the schoolhouse. He had an experience and he learned from it. Had an experience, learned from it. Didn't go through some dramatic behavioral process, but had observations and was able to pick up on the importance of that process. What is his theory? Well, it, it stems from the fact that during um, his coming of age in psychology, so to speak, there had been a departure from the strict uh, cognitive theories of Sigmund Freud and to the ideas of B.F. Skinner with the very strict behaviorist approach where um, we get reinforcement constantly from our environment and that's what shapes uh, our learning and our attitudes and our person instead of Freud's idea which was we have these deep-seated desires, beliefs, and then they express themselves almost randomly um, in our lives. And so what Bandura saw was that neither idea was accurately explaining what he was observing, he was observing in human behavior and specifically the way humans learn. And so he proposed a new idea um, which he called social cognitive theory. We kind of smush it together to social learning, and he had a basic model. The basic model looked like this, that the person is an interaction between the way they are now, the way they think they are now, and what the environment is telling them, okay? The person, the way they are, has a set of physical attributes and some deep-seated beliefs about themselves, uh, they receive feedback and give feedback to the environment about the way they are being and then they get information back from the environment and also their own behavior and their own extension of belief in the world. This triangle is what they call reciprocal dynamism the fact that it goes uh, both ways, that there's giving and taking of feedback among all aspects of the model to form the person. The person being the sum of the learning that takes place in this triadic model. Okay, that's Bandura's basic idea. That those three things work together to form the person. Now specifically, it forms the person in four principal ways. It is formed in the way that they observe and learn, and that way that that sharing happens, the way they regulate themselves, and then the way they believe uh, they will be able to survive, affect, change the world around them. That's the self-efficacy piece. Those components together reside within uh, the dynamic triad, and with his 
earliest research really focusing on observational learning, social learning. That's what we're going to focus on. But his later work and the things he's doing now um, really tend to focus more toward the, the moral aspect, the self-regulation and then the self-efficacy, which he believes um, are very, very important for the development, not only of healthy human beings, but of a more just and compassionate society. Um, during the research I did, I, I took a few uh, minutes uh, and, and actually observed some of his more recent talks about the necessary changes in people as far as self-regulation and self-efficacy for the betterment of the society. And he's still obviously doing a lot of research uh, on those things. But we're going to pull back and get back to social learning. And so this idea of observational learning, the social learning, he has developed three models uh, of it. And we sh are going to spend time defining them here. The first one is the live model. So if you and I are in a room and I'm trying to show you how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, then I have a set of materials for that and you have a set of materials for that and you observe me making the sandwich. In that way, you are hoping to be able to re in retain it and being able to translate and produce it again uh, by observing the live model. The second one would be a verbal instruction model where I give you a model in symbols of words and then you have to translate and be able to complete the steps accordingly. Now, this is probably where we spent a lot of our time um, right now and I know from what we learn all the time, uh, this is something that we're trying to get away from, but this is the heart of that. Taking words verbally and acting them out. The final idea, the symbolic model, very powerful tool and it's where his first and most famous experiment really played out when a child would observe symbolic action on a television screen, um, he would be able to then produce later uh, the actions in, in real world and a lot of what was observed there really caught the attention of a lot of people here in America and across the world for what are we, what are we modeling, what are we teaching uh, our children symbolically with the advent of media and uh, television and now, you know, since 1963, you can imagine <laughs> what are we teaching our kids with the advent of video games and all the things they're doing on the web. What are they observing? How much of that are they taking in symbolically? And then how much of that is acted out in real life? And those three models of observational learning are the crux of how we have taken what Bandura did with his initial theory and applied it to how can we get better at using this to help kids learn. So, five basic components of this observational learning, no matter which model uh, you're talking about. The first one is the symbolism, second, translation, then retention, attentiveness, how closely it ties to that retention, and then finally motivation, the driving force behind all of this. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on each one of these. We'll start with symbolism. So, it's important to recognize that humanity has a unique ability in creation to make sense of symbols, okay? We can use words to mean ideas, which we can translate back into action. We can see pictures to mean ideas and translate that into action. We can do the same thing with gestures and translate into meaning and then act accordingly. This ability to interpret symbolism um, has been called a lot of things and uh, in neurology they, they have kind of pointed to this thing as the thing that started evolutionary speaking, the human spark. What made us more different from the rest of creation is our ability to make sense of these symbols. Now there's some arguments on whether it's the social symbols that really cause that or if it's the effective symbols, uh, our ability to translate ideas to change the world around us. But one of those two things seems to be the cause, evolutionary speaking, of what happened in, in the order of uh, making us so much different than the rest of the creatures. That ability to recognize symbol comes with an important part of translation. It's a translation of meaning in and then expression out, back and forth. We have to take in the symbolic meaning, make sense of it, and then we have to be able to translate it and go back out. This process happens all the time. And it's a unique connection within both our body and our environment.
environment and our personality that goes back to his ideas about the, dry, the three sharings that happen all the time, that this constant interaction between those three components is happening, and that's very much a part of translation. And it, it's, okay, it's like a superhighway. The information superhighway, all those megabits we fly out compared to the social, environmental, and uh, personal highway that goes on in your brain constantly is, is even slow. Retention, the ability to actually put it into memory and be able to conjure it up again to use it, he, he calls retention. Uh, he talks about this as the necessary step to make use of the information. The actual learning requires this retention. That retention um, has some graduated steps uh, with reinforcement. Okay, If there's internal and external reinforcement, psychology really emphasized the external reinforcement uh, prior to Bandura, and so his ideas wanted to express the intrinsic, the personal connection to it, and, and that's what his theory has done. Uh, there's the pride and satisfaction of a sense of accomplishment for a job well done. Those sorts of things he perceived as helping learning. When we, when we feel those things, we want to go and do it again. And it's not a strict exterior thing, but it's something that wells up from within us, but it is just as important to retention as the external factors that have been covered in learning theory previously. Attention, okay, you must be attentive. You cannot go through the motions and receive feedback or um, interactions from the environment or hear yourself. If you're not attentive, you're not going to learn. So it's very important to him, for him, that you recognize these things and perceive them as a negative effect on your ability to learn so that we can all move it out. We certainly have uh, more attention, he says, when things are new or, or novel. There's a certain uh, you know, flavor of the month sort of thing. It's, it's more interesting for the human in general to be able to experience a wide variety of things, so it's important to change routine in his. And finally, the motivation. Um, we have to recognize that when we have a desire to learn, we have a better chance at it. So perceiving the symbol of, I will experience this thing again if I do this learning, causes us uh, to want to do it again. And that's a factor from the whole social cognitive theory. Not a, just an environmental thing, but the environment with the self causing the desire to model, imitate, learn come from ourselves. That's his idea. In general, summary, people do learn through observation. Whether you're Corporal Barnes or a toddler or each of us, uh, we learn through observation. The mental states, the attentiveness, the motivation are very important in learning. It's not just something that you can drill into people. There has to be some intrinsic uh, desire for that. And the learning itself doesn't always lead to behavior changes. And that was very much contradicting what the behavior said, which was enough discipline, enough remediation will eventually cause change in behavior. And Bandura realizes that the learning can go on and the behavior won't, won't change necessarily. So, in big steps, we have these ideas. We acquire, maintain, modify behaviors we see others perform. We decide what behaviors to keep and when to use them through the translations of symbolism and self-regulation. And Bandura puts the person back into the psychological model, an active person, an engaged person, not a deep-seated, repressed understanding of person, and not a person uh, discounted or moved away by constant returning from the environment, but he puts the person back into the learning model and the sharing of those three is more complete. So, a uh, little, little challenge, if you will, if uh, we've learned anything, we, we can check to see if we have. So I've uh, left this blank uh, intentionally, so maybe take a minute, okay, 10 seconds, okay, and fill in the chart. I would leave this a little longer probably with my students, but in honor of your time, maybe give you a word bank.